So um, what we want to just look at is a few chemicals and toxins before we move on to toxic matters. So one of the more common, which affects mostly green people, in our green body constitutions, do not have the cytochrome P450 in the detoxifying enzymes to break down sufficiently a substance called alpha-solanine. And alpha-solanine is something which is present in nightshade foods. And these nightshade foods <coughs> tend to be our potatoes, tomatoes, our um, peppers, and traditionally they say green peppers, but I think it, to some extent it's all peppers, and eggplants or aubergines. So solanine, or solidine, and is an alkaloid produced by the decomposition of solanine as a white crystalline substance having a harsh, bitter taste. That's the substance. It's fat-soluble neurotoxin. And it's a neurotoxin because it paralyzes the nerve from being able to produce acetylcholine. Now, acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter on the neuromuscular junctions. So every neuromuscular junction between the voluntary nerves coming into the muscle fibers is run by acetylcholine. All of our parasympathetic nervous system, our eyes and our gut, is run by acetylcholine. And most important is our memory recall is by acetylcholine. So as I always say, if you eat potatoes, tomatoes, green peppers and aubergines, and you're a green, then you've got to be very careful not to overload it because this buildup of the solanine reaches a critical point and then you start getting the paralysis. And the paralysis may be just minor. Your eyes won't focus so well. So you can't read so well. You think, oh, you're doing this all the time because the pupil is dilated because it's the acetylcholine constricts it. You can't think so well because of the memory recall. Your bowels don't feel very good and your heart maybe starts to race a bit because you're losing the acetylcholine, which is like the break on, on the heart rate. Okay. And your neuromuscular, symptom, your neuromuscular junctions start to ache because they're less efficient. And this, of course, as you know, was our secret weapon in the London Olympics. So we put McDonald's into the, um, into the stands there. So all the foreign athletes, who are mostly green, we allowed them to have tomato sauce and burgers, okay? <laughs> and chips, okay? And we fed them solanine and solanine, so they didn't know what was happening. And our boys, of course, were eating salad and steak, organic, of course. Okay? <laughs> and that's why we won all the races, okay, as simple as that. So if you want to really wreck a football team or anything else, give them potatoes, because they're all tall, or most of them are. Give them potatoes and tomatoes, lots and lots of tomato sauce on chips, absolutely perfect. Although having said that, I myself, if I do have chips, I find I tolerate chips better than potatoes. And I couldn't work this one out. Is it because they take the potatoes fresh from the fields, wash them and, you know, in the factory, chop them up and froze them? No, I think it's because they use old potatoes. And old potatoes have thicker skins, which have less solanine in them. So remember, the higher the solanine is, the thinner the skin. So the younger and the smaller the potato, the more sensitive it is to light. And this is why if you go to a supermarket and just before it's going to close, you'll find they cover over the potato rack, usually with plastic or a sacking, so that the potatoes are not exposed to the light during the night time. Okay? Because they usually leave the lights on in supermarkets at night time in case someone sneaks their way into there. So they cover them over and keep them in the dark. So if you leave a potato in the light for long enough, it will go green. But sometimes you don't see the green. They look all right in a packet, particularly if they're in a bag, and you get them home, and then you peel the first one and you see, gee, this isn't yellow or white, this is green under there. And then you go for the next one and the next one and the next one. If in doubt and you're green and you're solely insensitive, just don't touch them, okay? But my experience is that Older, or, or what they call main crop, or bigger potatoes, are better for you. Why sometimes, like the, um, the baked potato here would be all right, but if you had new potatoes at lunchtime, you know, some of the greens here would be asleep in no time at all. Okay. So solanine is a toxin to the neuromuscular junctions and can affect anywhere where acetylcholine works, potentially. <coughs> so other acetylcholine blockers which are prevalent in solanine-containing foods. 
Now, it doesn't mean you can't touch any of these. It's the total loading. It's a chemical overload. Eggplants, which we call aubergines here, green peppers. But to be honest, I find, you know, when I'm bad, red peppers, yellow peppers, orange peppers all do the same thing. The green peppers are green because it's the green is the color, right? It's like tomatoes are green before they go red. And the red is just purely lycopene, which is a carotenoid in the tomato. But underneath the red is the green still, right? So don't be fooled that, oh, my, and the same with a, a red pepper started off green. If you've grown pate, uh, peppers, they're green, all of them to begin with, and then they go the color later on because of the carotenoid. Potato, we talked about, tomato. Tobacco, that's if you chew it. Uh, spices, depends on the spice, really. Um, I think it's mainly chilies. Black pepper, maybe. Paprika, uh, those more the, more the peppery, spicy ones. Obviously, potato starch, because that goes with the potato and tomato paste. Tomato paste is probably less than whole tomatoes, radishes. Broccoli, you know, um, might do, chili. But your main ones are going to be, for most people, is simply potatoes and tomatoes with a possibly a bit of pepper, green peppers and things, and a little bit of eggplant, but most people don't have it too often. But, you know, I like ratatouille and that's a pity. So there's quite a nice sort of thing, what we call the Greek salad or ratatouille, a typical sort of nice. So symptoms you might get joint pains, as I mentioned. Why? Abdominal bloating because of the lack of peristalsis. Urinary bladder weakness. Remember the bladder? You find this sometimes with children, don't you, who get enuresis. One of the first things to check with enuresis with children, particularly, and adults, is, um, uh, is solanine poisoning. Okay? It's a fundamental... I sometimes forget this myself. As soon as a new patient comes in and they weaken to green, it's one of the first things I do is pop the solanine marker on, which Jill's going to talk about in the next part with the starter kit, and or potatoes, tomatoes, and so on, if you haven't got those, just to clear that out of the way. Because it is so many symptoms are related to this, and you can miss them, in it, but it's mainly with the green people. So bladder weakness, pupillary dilation, because you can't constrict the pupil. Uh, dry mouth um, is because the saliva is parasympathetic. Skin rashes, weight gain, tiredness. Um, and then in the short term, uh, concentration problems, abdominal cramps, premenstrual tension, depression, kidney inflammation, dizziness, sleepiness, vision problem. In the long term, um, uh, you've got here possibilities related to spina bifida, low thyroid, vision problems, loss of night vision, cancers, loss of memory, birth defects, depression, osteoporosis, arthritis. Certainly a lot of people, particularly with inflammatory joint arthritis, rheumatoid, are made incredibly better by just coming off potatoes and tomatoes than if you do nothing else, particularly with the green people. So challenge for toxicity, um, in other words, with the eye position that we're going to talk about uh, shortly, and from weakness with the definitive meridian, and then check the person against chemicals, toxic metals, radiation, uh, for any form of toxicity. Uh, if you've got toxins, and they're chemical toxins, generally speaking, the things which are help to stimulate uh, the phase one and phase two would be your N-acetylcysteine. Uh, black walnut tincture is excellent. Lemon balm, that we talked about. Rosemary yarrow is a very, very good herb here, and other spices. And, of course, N-acetylcysteine being the kingpin there. Now, let's talk about metals toxic metals. Um, <coughs> we used to call toxic metals heavy metals, um, but heavy metals imply that they're high up in the periodic table. And not all toxic metals are high up in the periodic table. When we looked at using colour as a diagnostic tool and the acetates across a person's eye, red people or people who weaken to the red tend to have a strong affinity to aluminium. And aluminium is not a heavy metal. It's a light metal. Green people tend to weaken to nickel, and blue people to mercury, which is a heavy metal. Okay? So we don't use that word heavy metals anymore. We use toxic metals. And you now know that a toxic metal is toxic because it displaces a normal cofactor or element, which is the key factor or the key to getting the enzyme to work. 
So you remember when we talked about carbonic anhydrase being a zinc-dependent enzyme, mercury coming in from, say, leaking amalgams will be swallowed into the stomach, taken up by the oxyntic cells, and displaces or uses up zinc in there, and then you get a dummy so that the, um, the uh, uh, carbonic anhydrase can't function properly, and you end up then with a dry stomach. So one of the major causes of achlorhydra or hyperchlorhydra is leaking amalgams where the mercury goes down into the stomach. Okay. So from that, if mercury displaces or fills in the spot where the zinc should be in the, in the carbonic anhydrase, what do you think, question, what do you think would be the answer to the mercury toxicity? Simple, increase the zinc, so it displaces the mercury. Okay, if the bad guy displaces the good guy, then you increase the good guy to displace the bad guy. And the good guy will always be above or below the element, which is the bad guy on the periodic table, left or right, or occasionally diagonal. But it will be adjacent to the bad one. So it'll be one above or below. And obviously you don't want to supplement cadmium when you've got mercury uh, toxicity. You want to do the good one, which would be zinc, something which is vital. So the bad guy has displaced and become a toxic metal because it's displaced a good one. So you increase the concentration of the good one. Okay. So you may need something else which will help chelate it out. But generally, it's a matter that you only accumulate the bad ones if you haven't got enough of the good ones. Same with bad bacteria in the gut, isn't it? How do you get rid of bad bacteria in the gut? Supply more good ones okay, to displace them. So it makes sense then. So toxic metals, um, here we have the periodic table, as it's called. And we should see zinc here on column 12. And here we've got mercury. And here we've got cadmium. All right. So if you've got mercury as your toxic metal showing, you don't give the person another toxic metal, cadmium, and you give them zinc to displace it. So you look on your periodic table, um, always keep a periodic table handy. I keep one under my front doormat, and people say, why is that? It's because it's a poster and it got bents. So I keep it under there to flatten it out. And whenever the children come up and we talk about chemistry or something, which we do occasionally, I say, oh, I've got the periodic table. Oh, where is it, Dad? It's under the front mat. And they're <laughs> always fascinated why I keep my periodic table under the front mat in the, in the hallway. So the periodic table. Uh, is a series of elements with similar chemical and physical characteristics in the different columns there. Now, the major ones that we will come across very, very frequently are these three, because they relate directly to the body types or the constitutional inability to detoxify. So here we've got aluminium. So remember, aluminium is with red people, okay? So in other words, they have a genetic predisposition to not being able to detoxify aluminium. Mercury is for the blue people, and nickel is for the green people. Now we know that people weaken to one of those three wavelengths of color. And the reason they weaken to that is because it overpowers the cones in the back of the eye. And we know that the cones are composed of certain carotenoids called lutein and zeaxanthin, etc. But they have a particular substance called melanin. And it's called neuromelanin or red, uh, uh, melanopsin is the actual technical word for the melanin in the back of the eyes. And there's three types of melanin and it's genetic which ones you have. In the same way you have melanin in your hair and that's genetic from your parents for the color of it. And the same way you have it on your skin. So red people will weaken to the red. Have we got some acetates? If we just quickly demonstrate that. So red people will weaken to red. Green people should, of course, weaken to green, again, on both eyes. And blue people will weaken to blue. And there'll always be a predisposition to these metals. So what we're going to do is to take a person who's a red person. So do we have a red person now? Oh, perfect. So we have a red person here. And if you can get some aluminium. Have we got an aluminium? <coughs> okay. So let's pop that to there. Okay. So pull your knee to your shoulder. So if we put the red on, and you weaken to the red, so you've got the hair to go with the red.
Now, many years ago when I started doing this, I discovered that a lot of people would close their eyes when they had the color on which weakened them, because neurologically they didn't like it. Okay? Although you do occasionally get people say, well, that's my favorite color. And I say, well, that's interesting, because that's your bad color. But they say, oh, I like that color. Okay. So close your eyes, and they still weaken. And I thought, this is strange. It can't be anything to do with the cones in the back of the eye if they close their eyes. So I started moving it up a bit and putting it on the forehead like that. So there was no input at all to the cones. And lo and behold, they still weaken. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't quite work really that out, except for the fact we do have receptors in the skin which we know do pick up shades of light. So if we put the red over the tummy there, you actually get over the tummy button area there, if we put it there, you get an even bigger reaction than the eyes. You know, you've got no power at all to it there. But the secret here is we cover it over. So she doesn't, she can't see that now, okay? And then she doesn't weaken. So it's the light from outside going through the acetate into the skin, okay? and then from the skin into the cells underneath, which causes the reaction. Okay? So what happens here is it's sensitive from the light outside. These are the forms of light that come into us, or packages of light, are called photons, and we measure these in wavelengths between the, on the visible spectrum. So this one is 690 nanometers, very specific, and that's the one that overpowers her. And because her receptors in her uh, macula of the eye with the cones, and on the skin there, it's called melanin, and it's melanin which is absorbed. And genetically, she can't take that wavelength, okay? It overpowers her, because genetically, somewhere between mum and dad, there was a red gene, if you like, which is your body constitution. And years later, we started building up a pattern with red people, and one of them is most of them couldn't tolerate wheat, particularly whole wheat. So they were irritated by eating wheat. Not everybody weakens to wheat, but on the other hand, whole wheat um, was, a, was a problem with them. And we found various other things like APOE4 gene expression. Homocysteine was another one which we're, uh, Jill will talk about a bit later. But one of the things which was common here was aluminium, or aluminum as the Americans call it. And we put that on the person and pull, and they go eat. Now not everybody who's red will weaken to aluminium. Okay? You'll only weaken to aluminium if you've got an excess for you but you're like a magnet to aluminium because as soon as you build up your tolerance to it and you, you have an inability to detoxify at the amount that you should do, okay? In the same way that I'm a green and I can't detoxify nickel very easily. So luckily I don't have studs, piercings or anything else and so I'm not exposed to nickel, okay? But I do get nickel rashes sometimes from jeans, from the buckle on jeans which is nickel and if I irritate there and then, ah, I've worn, particularly on sweaty days, you know, if it's hot and you've been in the garden and you've been bending a lot, the buckle sometimes actually touches the skin and then you start developing a rash. And in the same way, blue people are very sensitive to mercury, as we see. And they have to avoid mercury, you know, as much as they possibly can. So with you, you have to avoid aluminium. And aluminium is present in a number of things, which we'll see in a minute. But one of the most common, of course, in youngsters is vaccines. So it tends to be a lot in vaccinations. But the most common cause or um, uh, source of aluminium is what? Deodorants. Deodorants, yes, good, but even more than deodorant. Take away, from the, Take away from the, the kettle. Yes, the kettle, exactly. The kettle is the main one. Either the kettle is made of aluminium because it's nice and light, or the element is, is the aluminium. So you can say steel. You need a kettle with a glass bottom with the element underneath it, okay? So either a plastic, which is pretty hard plastic that won't dissolve, or better to use a stainless steel saucepan in the first place and heat your water. If you use a kettle, the majority of elements are aluminium. So industrial kettles, i.e. in hotels and things when you have tea, coffee and things, will be a fantastic source of aluminium. Aluminium is very water soluble. If I put aluminium foil into a cup there, a glass of water, and if you heat that water up to body temperature, which isn't that high, within five minutes that'll weaken you completely, okay? So what do most people do when they cook meat? They wrap it in aluminium foil, don't they? Of 
great for the red households all around. You know, they're all going to increase their aluminium quite nicely. So what you do is you wrap the chicken in greaseproof paper, that's right. Then you cover it with aluminium foil, okay? Because as the chicken heats up, it sweats and the steam comes off, hits the aluminium and the aluminium dissolves and goes straight back into the chicken quite nicely. So if you've got greaseproof paper and then you put the aluminium on the outside, it'll drain off, right? So that's the way you, you do your cooking. So the same way if you cook fish and you want to cook it in you know, aluminium foil, wrap it in the greaseproof paper first. Thank you. Um, so if I put that one there, that's the aluminium. 